I would argue that each finds its genesis in its predecessor, so we'll tackle them chronologically. First, we'll start with the Wabanaki Birch Park Canoe, with representatives from the Passamaquoddy and Penobscot building styles. Today, I'm speaking to you in the land adjacent to Agua Hasidek, or landing place, where uh, today is Fort Point, near the Isik, or the clam place, the first place where clams were good to eat coming out of the river system. And Uni Gan Isidek, uh, Uni Gan Isek, the short carry across the neck of Cape Jellison to Wasumkig, the shining beach on today's Sears Island. And continuing on to the Pasagasa Wakakeg, or the Sturgeon Place River, as we know as the Passy down in Belfast. These landmarks show the importance of fishing and navigating the watershed for the Penobscot peoples. The current groups, recognize, uh, the current groups of recognized Wabanaki and Maine are the Penobscot, located around the bay and river of that name, as well as their tributaries. The Passamaquoddy peoples, located around the bay of that name and its tributaries. And the Maliseet, located in the north of Maine, around the St. John River tributary system. Historically, other peoples, such as the Kennebec, lived in Maine. One can travel from northern Maine down to the ocean, by the extensive tributary networks and rivers of the major rivers, the Kennebec, the Penobscot, and the St. John. Given the vast waterway system, it is possible with relatively short overland carries to go almost anywhere in the state by canoe. The canoe builders designed their canoes to take advantage of the natural resources in the area. There is not a piece of metal in these boats and repairs could make, be made with resources readily at hand. First photo, please. Are we up? Okay. The canoe birch is the most abundant and largest, 100 feet tall and 30 inches in diameter at the butt. In Maine and surrounding Canadian provinces and United States, the birch's layers, which range, did you want more? Yes, please which range from a chalky white outer layer to a light tan on the inner layers to a greenish rind between the trunk and bark, which measures about an eighth of an inch in thickness. Builders scout the woods for straight, tall trees with unblemished bark from the snow line to the lowest large limbs and return to cut when the sap is flowing, either in the winter thaws or in the spring when the bark peels easily. The bark is resinous and has elasticity without stretching or shrinking, making a preferable canoe skin. And back to mine. So the black spruce grows in the same area as the canoe birch and its roots are good for lacing birch bark together and its resin is good for waterproofing seams. The roots are 20 feet in length and have a pencil sized diameter while still being tough, durable, and flexible. Because it grows in soft, moist ground, it's, the roots grow close to the surface and can be dug up easily. Spruce resin was made to spruce gum and tempered with animal, animal fat, often bear fat, which, like a heavy syrup, can be spread to make the canoe waterproof. The northern white cedar again grows in the same region and is used for the ribs, and other woodwork in the canoe. It splits cleanly and readily along the grain when dry and well seasoned, so fallen timber, timber from blowdowns or spring floods can be used. If split properly with applied steam or hot water, the ribs bent and set into shape. So the two birch bark canoes in our collection represent the canoe building styles of the Passamaquoddy and Penobscot peoples of Maine. Both styles share common characteristics with the Maliseet people of the Canadian Maritimes and St. John River communities. The canoes were used on large rivers like the, Pas the Penobscot and St. John's and the ocean bays like the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, and Fundy. The ocean-going canoes, which navigate the waves, had high peaked ends with a marked overhang 
fore and aft. The end profiles had a sloping outline with a strong curve from the bottom to the tip of the stem and sharply lifted shear or a curvature that goes from the bow to the stern. The ocean going bottoms were V-shaped to cut through the waves while the river canoes were more rounded. It had lower ends and less of a rake from bow to stern. Up above in the loft, so we'll slowly make our way there. Up in the loft, we see a later style of canoe that has rounded almost half circle ends and almost no shear. This rounded end style is what inspired the wood and canvas canoes. And then we're gonna come back down here. So in 1878, Tom Francis, a well-known Passamaquoddy canoe builder, built this 18-foot canoe. The traditional Passamaquoddy porpoise and seal hunting canoes were built in similar lengths and had a rocker bottom. The midsection has, is well rounded and has a slack bilge and a high reverse tumble home. So the top of the boat is narrower than the rounded bilges below it. The trend of low and rounded ends as opposed to high peaked ends started in the St. Lawrence and St. John rivers in 1849 and moved to the coast in 1874. Recreation played a large part in the survival of the park canoe. Tom Francis built this canoe and sold it to a Searsport minister who paid $25 for it, about a month's wage at the time. Both Wabanaki and non-natives built bark canoes for sporting camps as well as lumbermen and anyone who needed a light portable boat. The builders of custom-made bark canoes could not keep up with the demand and started looking for a way to mass produce the design. Starting in the 1880s, the wooden canvas canoe would supplant park canoes in the marketplace. So as custom built birch bark canoes lost popular favor, the traditional building of Wabanaki canoes went dormant. The tradition was revitalized in the last few decades and in the summer of 2006, Abenaki builder Aaron York, assisted by two Penobscots, Hugga and Gwen Hewitt Dana built the ocean style canoe, which we see here. In Penobscot, they're known as a credence. It is fast and can be paddled by four efficiently. Two people could pick it up. Park canoes of this size created the early European explorer, explorers in the early 1600s. The Europeans were impressed by the lightweight but strongly built park canoes which had a great load carrying capacity in shallow water. George Weymouth in his 1603 voyage saw bark canoes west of the Penobscot Bay and was amazed with the speed that three to four Wabanaki paddlers could pass his ship's boats manned with four oarsmen. He, like the many we see at the museum, at festivals and demonstrations with this canoe were captivated by the workmanship. So let's look at that workmanship. Here we have the gunnels, which served as a building frame. The thwart ends tenon into the gunnels with lacing holes in the ends. The gunnel ends supported by the headboards stepped on heels of the lower stem pieces. The stems break outward from their heels. The gunnel ends join to the head of the stem piece by outwales and caps. At the stem pieces, the two flaps of birch bark were folded one over the other to cover the inner gunnel and the stem ends. And on the outside, to, there are another flap 
of birch bark that protected the get the gunnel and lashings and were known as wallegesis or the word for outer bark of a tree or a child's diaper. Some builders added designs to these flaps. But there are differences between the Penobscot and the Passamaquoddy styles. The Penobscot bark canoe has end caps that stop flush with the stem piece. Whereas the bark canoe, the Passamaquoddy canoe here, the end caps go past the stem. Both of these are customary for the dis different tribal canoes. So now we'll talk about the building method. A canoe building spot needs to be smooth, free of stones and roots and anything else that could damage the bark. The soil needs to hold stakes firmly upright. Shade prevented the bark from drying too fast in the sunlight. And since the whole family was involved, it had to be near food and water. Canoe building sites meeting all these criteria were held by generations of Wabanaki families. The gunnels were put together and used as a plan outline of the canoe on the building bed. Great care was taken to bend the gunnels alike so the center line is straight and true. The middle thwart is placed exactly mid-length to help with the bend, and the gunnel ends are shaped to meet and fit each other in a smooth joint. So our next picture, please. Uh, the assembled gunnel is centered above the building bed and weighed down with stones. Stakes are driven in pairs across from each other along the gunnel frame. Once all is in place, the stakes and gunnel frame are set aside and a roll of birch bark with the white side up is spread out on the bed. The gunnel frame is returned to its place and the birch bark slashed for gores, so the birch bark can be turned up. Maliseet canoes have flush seams rather than overlaps in the top sides and bottom. Once the bark is turned up, the stakes are replaced and additional birch bark are added to the deficits. So back on our canoe, the Maliseet sides are pieced together in one to three panels rather than one long narrow panel. The mid-length length paddle requires the greatest strength and is lashed together with a halved batten root, half root batten with an over and over stitch. The over and over stitch, which runs square on the outside and diagonally on the inside of the bark, like we see here, so it's diagonally on the outside and runs square there. Uh, could be pulled tight and waterproofed with gum. The next panels outward of the middle lashed with a back stitch, which can also be pulled tight and waterproofed. Any additional outward panels above the waterline, if they're needed, are laced with an in and out stitch, which cannot be pulled tight without causing the bark to pucker and split, and therefore cannot be waterproofed with gum. The ends are sewn with an over and over stitch. Once the sides are pieced out, the bark is turned up and around the gunnel frame and clamped perpendicularly so the gores can be trimmed and laced edge to edge. So our next picture, please. The gunnel frame is lifted and sprung to the correct fore and aft shear. For canoes with sharply turned shears at the ends, the gunnel members would need to be pre-laminated and bent with steam prior to gunnel assembly. A common maliseet measurement for the shearing of the gunnels at the end points, at the end post was the length of the forearm from the knuckles of the crunched fish fist to the back of the elbow. So back to our canoe here. Maliseet canoes have out rails, which are pegged through to the, through the bark and to the inner gunnel. 
once the outwells are secured to the inner gunnel, the excess bark standing above is trimmed with the flap to cover the top of the inner gunnel. The bark is lashed to the assembled gunnels with two to three lashings that go through the same hole to avoid the holes being too close together and appears as a W from the outboard. On our next picture, the canoe is lifted off the building bed and set at a convenient working height, turtled on logs or crude sawhorses. The stem pieces are added at this point after being boiled and curved into the desired shape. The outwheel ends are notched on the inside to take the head of the stem piece with enough leeway on the stem piece and outwheels for adjustments. Any lashing on the bottom is done. Then the canoe is flipped right side up on the bed and the inner seams, gores, and side panels, as well as any splits, holes, or thin spots are filled with gum and covered with a narrow strip of gummed bark. On our next picture, we see the planking. The two lengths of planks meet amidships and are held in place with temporary ribs. At the turn of the bilge, the planking bends from the pressure of the temporary ribs and the bark is wetted to allow the angular bilge to turn into a roughly rounded form. Care is taken in the planking below the gunnel so that the top streak fits up against the lashing. On our next picture, the permanent ribs are steamed and put into place in the bevel of the gunnel. The ribs are driven home with a club and a driving batten at a slant towards the midships. The ribs must fit tight enough to slightly stretch the bark and put pressure on the whole width of the planking. The lacings on the bark are kept wet to make them elastic. The canoe is then allowed to stand a few days and the ribs are reset. So back on my screen. Inside is the headboard. And the headboard top has a small tenon at the center line that fits into a hole on the inner, inner side of the inner gunnel. The cavity between the stem and the headboards are stuffed with dry cedar shavings or moss to help the sta sides stand firm where the planking does not reach. In our last picture, the canoe is once again turtled and the seams, holes, and patches are gummed smoothly on the outside. The ends from the beginning of the seam to above the waterline are heavily gummed and covered with a piece of gummed cloth. Above the cloth, the end seams are filled with gum to make them flesh between the stitches. So with literally thousands of lakes, ponds, rivers, and streams, and over 2,500 miles of coastline in the state, it was only natural that the canoe became an essential tool of survival and recreation. Whether it's the whitewater rapids or lazy rivers, there is a main built canoe for every condition. Like the canoe, Maine's fishing boats have a form suited to their function. The shallow nutrient rich Gulf of Maine and the rivers which flow into it create the perfect breeding grounds for fish, shellfish and other marine life. The Wabanaki peoples and the European colonists after them were attracted to the marine bounty and built fishing boats to catch the rich resource. Some unique boat forms were designed to function off Maine's rocky coastline. The double-ended design of the canoe found its way into the symmetrical ends of the peapod, which we'll visit now. So today we're going to learn about uh, two pea pods built on Matinicus Island. Um, uh, the first was built by Leon Linwood Young, who was born in 1878 on the island of Matinicus, the outermost island on Penobscot Bay, 20 miles from the mainland. So here we have the Matinicus Island Group, Rockland, is here, Searsport is way up here. 
So along with Creehaven, also known as Ragged Arse Island back in the day, Matinicus Rock, Seal Island, Wooden Ball Island, and a few smaller islands, the Matinicus Island group are the most remote inhabited islands in Maine. Uh, Leon lived all his life on the island until his death in 1958. You may have read about the islanders in Elizabeth Ogilvie's fiction novels or learned about Abby Burgess, who tended the rock at Matinicus Rock. So first picture, please. So fishing was a way of life on the island. A young settled on the island in 1765. Descendants built most of the boats. And by 1900, lobstering had become the main trade, replacing offshore and nearshore fishing for mackerel and cod. To access the rocks and ledges where the lobster congregated, the youngs developed their double ender, known elsewhere as the pea pod. Here is Lynn's house and boat shop in the barn from Matinicus Island photo, from a Matinicus Island photo album. So if we can go back to my screen, great. So this is the 1925 uh, built Matinicus Peapod built by Lynn Young. Um, it's 15 feet long and with a beam of four feet, seven eighths inches. So on Matinicus, these are called double enders. Most mainland people call them pea pods because they're kind of shaped like that vegetable with pointed ends and full bellied bilges. Noted naval architect and maritime historian Howard Chappelle sees a lineage from the Penobscot and Passamaquoddy birch bark canoes, and I'm inclined to agree, although he also likened them to a whaleboat or a double ended no man's land boat from Vineyard Sound. Uh, Maine fishermen developed the type about 1870. One story is it came from around Isleshead on the coastline, another that was Vinyl Haven. The design caught on throughout Maine's rocky coastline, including Matinicus. Some double unders like this one were used for rowing only and were known for tracking well for long distances and as a fast boat if the rower was experienced. Others could be sailed with an added, set, an added center board trunk and a shallow false keel as a secondary means of propulsion when the wind was from the stern for a running tack or just slightly off for a reaching tack. They didn't go to weather that is close to the wind very well. The boat was steered with a, under sail with an oar. Sailing gave the lobstermen a chance to rest their arms. So if we can go to the next photo, we're going to see a chart. And you'll notice the operative word on this chart is ledge. Matinicus ledges start in the harbor and encircle the island. As a, the pea pod could be rowed forwards or backwards without the need to turn the boat 180 degrees. It could fit into the narrow crevices of the ledge to catch lobsters. Large boats would not fit into these ledges and a motor would be beat up on the rocks. This boat type built for its environment and function became the quintessential main boat from Casco Bay to Machias Bay. So if you go back to me. So pea pods were strongly built. Some early ones had natural crook hackamatack frames. Later boats like this one had oak steam belt bed frames. So here's the oak frames that go from gunnel to gunnel. Uh, you can also see the steam bed floor timbers, just these little half ones in the middle of the boat. This is an example of a cedar planked lap straight boat. This construction method overlaps the planks. So there's a plank here, overlapping the next one underneath it, overlapping the next one underneath it. The construction method of overlapping the planks and fastening them to each other into the frame 
provides a double thickness that gives longitudinal face, uh, strength. The fastenings are either clinked nails, so clinked is you nail in from this side, and then you have an iron that you would hold the iron here on this side and it folds the tip of the nail over. So this is what's called clink. Um, or sometimes they used rivets like what are on your jeans. You can see the rabbit line in the stem of the boat. So you can see there's sort of this notch here. So the rabbit, here's the plank that fits into that notch. And then you would attach through the plank into the stem of the boat. And so here's the rabbit line, sort of that groove where the planks fit in. A Northern European boat builders originated this design around 300 AD to withstand the stormy North Sea. This double ender has little strips of wood to sort of round the edges of the boat. So the plank is here and then it has a rounded little piece of wood here. So it's not a sharp corner. It's sort of a rounded corner and that each one of these planks has that. So that protects your knees but also protects the plank from wear and tear. Additional details are she has beads cut into the planks. So there's a nice, you know, two grooves cut into the plank there. Um, her knees for the seats right here have a nice curve. So even though she's a working boat, she's a pretty one. A typical pea pod is about 300 pounds or so and 15 feet like this one. You could have a longer one at 20 feet. And others for recreation would be shorter and wider. The weight helps the double ender stability in maintaining momentum when rowing against a head sea. So you can imagine a big boat really helps when you, or a, you know, the sharp ends help you keep moving forward. Uh, the other boat we have was built by Lynn's son, Merrill C. Young, who was born in, on the mainland of, in Rockland in 1907, but mom and baby soon returned to Meticus for his childhood. He, dialed, he died in Rockland in 1974. In the 1930s, he worked as a private yacht crewman before marrying in 1932 and living on Islesboro, where he ran a boat shop. Then he moved to Camden in the 1950s, so here we see him at his house in the 1950s, where he worked as a fisherman and as a master builder at the Lee Boat Shop Incorporated in Rockland. This photo was taken for a 1972 article in National Fisherman. So there's his names on the garage, M.C. Young. He also built boats in his spare time in the barn from large boats to little double enders. And here we have a photo of a cruising boat, a recreational boat he built at his house. Uh, he kept a small shop on Matinicus also where he continued to build double enders. And Irving Nevels took this picture for a 1969 article in National Fisherman. So out on Matinicus, when Orrin Ames, who, who we see here, wanted a double ender, he went to Merrill Young. Orrin fished this boat for about 20 years before he sold it. It was the last double ender fished on the island, the end of a century of tradition. The photograph was taken for a 1976 article in National Fisherman, and the image clearly shows, which we'll look on the actual boat, it shows the stand-up oarlocks and a potholder 
typically used in hand lobstering out of Matinicus. So we'll look at them on this. The boat we have in our collection. So here we have Merrill's double ender. It's rigged so that the fishermen could stand up to push the boat facing forward towards the rocks and ledges or sit to pull in the open water. Orrin didn't bother sitting down and had backward facing oarlocks that we see here put into his new boat. To stand while rowing, the oarlocks have about a four to eight inch extension. So you can see those are taller than your typical oarlocks. So he could stand and row. They're mismatched, probably one got lost. Other, orlo uh, other pea pods would have one station for sitting and another for pulling. But we just have the one set of oarlocks here. Note also the mismatched oars. One is ash, almost worn through from work. The other is a spruce one, probably a modern replacement because there's a little bit of varnish left. And you can see the fire hose that was put on it to protect it from wear. Typical oars were eight feet long, considered short to work in the confined ledges. Aft in the boat is the roller that we talked about. And so that helps to make pulling up 70 pound waterlogged traps much easier. And there's a removable masonite bulkhead under that seat that separates the forward area from the back of the boat. So helps contain those lobsters when they get loose, I guess. The boat's shape helps the lobsterman to do his job. Like we said, the ends are pointed to make rowing steadily for miles possible. The round, bilges, sorry. The round full body bilges uh, could be used as a mechanical advantage for pulling up the traps by putting all his weight on one gunnel. So if we can imagine I'm standing in the boat, one foot on that gunnel, I put all my weight down, grab the trap line, flip back to this gunnel with my other foot here, um, and use the momentum to pull the trap in hand over hand. A good pea pod can support a 20 pound weight on one gunnel. So you have to be a relatively medium sized lobsterman. Uh, the round bilges also aid in stability in rough water and for standing up and pulling traps. So Oren was very careful with his double ender, despite fishing close to the labyrinth of rocks and ledges off Matinicus Harbor. There are no repaired frames or planks. And there's wear on the aft. So this is where he would pull up the trap here. There's an extra piece of wood here where the trap would come up and rest there. So that's sort of the sacrificial piece of wood for the trap to wear up against. But so that's really the only wear and tear on the boat. Next picture, please. So here we have Orrin Ames again, fishing off Matinicus. According to his son, Kenny Ames, Orrin never switched to power, preferring to fish his 50 or so traps by hand. Kenny started fishing by rowing as well, but shifted to power as soon as he could. The perfect pea pod, which has a symmetrical double-ended design, was not very conducive shape for a motor. So main lobsterman builder, lobster boat builders eventually adapted the form into a pumpkin seed shape with a pointed bow and a broader stern to balance out the weight of the engine. This photo was taken for a 1975 article in National Fisherman. 
Uh, this is an example of a Carvel planked pea pod. So the other one was lap streak. This one, the edges are smooth. They're not overlapped. It's one plank on top of the other. Uh, and so you would need caulking between each seam to prevent water intrusion. This type was designed in the 14th century Mediterranean area who were trying to build larger vessels for sea voyages. This construction method creates a strong flexible boat in which a single busted plate plank could be replaced without disturbing its neighbors, like in the lap streak. It's a heavier boat because the planks have to be thicker to hold the caulking. In addition to be used for lobstering, the lighthouse service commissioned sailing pea pods for transport to and from lighthouses to do utility work on offshore installations. So the rowing pea pod gave way to motorized boats with the advent of engines. An example of a quintessential Maine lobster boat is the Jones Porter, which we'll learn about next. Uh, so welcome, we're here uh, at, on the Beals Island lobster boat. She's known today as the Genevieve, and she was built in 1950 by Vinyl Beal. So we'll start on, we'll just walk over here. So while I climb aboard, we'll start with photo one. Okay, so here we have the builder Vinyl Beal, who built the lobster boat originally named the Buddy and Sylvia for his son, Osmond Buddy Beal. Buddy was serving in the army in England at the time and received snapshots and letters from home that charted Vinyl's progress on the boat. Sylvia was Buddy's then girlfriend. Uh, could you go to photo two? Here we have the crew, the building crew, posing beside the boat as they are planking the ribs of the boat. Note that the boat is built right side up and there's plenty of planking on hand. So there's the two building crew that day. And you can see the ribs of the boat and just the top planks put on. And when you're ready, let's go to photo three. So here's the work crew relaxing after getting the boat painted and ready for launching. Oh, that's a good question. What kind of wood? I don't know, Sarah. I mean, it's, it's going to be Maine wood, so I'm going to guess pine or some other shipbuilding, maybe cedar or pine. Um, and then the next photo. So here you can see the stern of the boat. Uh, her propeller shaft is there without a propeller on it, and then the rudder is right there. She's a skeg built boat, and we'll talk about what a skeg is a little later in the program, but just look at how her stern kind of slopes down. There's that nice thin
Okay, I think we're ready for number five, please. So here's her Oldsmobile engine that powered the Buddy and Sylvia. Lobster boats at the time often had marinized op automobile engines. And the local car dealer, I think they said from Bangor, would come over and visit the shipyards and bring samples down. Um, and so, the way it's explained to me is that a boat engine, because it's always going uphill in first gear, it never gets to glide down the hill. So here's her engine. Um, the gasoline truck engines were often marinized by having a four bolt main bearing caps instead of just two. And to fight corrosion, a marinized engine had forged steel crankshafts, upgraded aluminum alloy pistons, bronze expansion plugs, and a special head gear. Marinized engines minimized movements by having internal screens on the marine starter motor and the alternator that cooled any internal flame or spark to prevent igniting fuel vapors and the fuel system had a vented fuel pump that led any excess fuel to the carburetor and not into the engine compartment. Raw water cools the engine by circulating. So Gina, I don't know if you can zoom back to my screen. So here's her engine. It's a Chevy 292. Um, that's her flame reducer there um, and the manifold. is there. And so a 292 Chevrolet was what was used by Chevrolet for truck, en truck engines from 1963 to 1990. And so they're very common on main boat boats from that era. Okay, can we go to photo six, please? Um, here's Lucky, the dog. Construction was supervised by Lucky, who is the boatyard and lobster dog. Uh, it was Vinyl Beale's constant companion, whether they were fishing or boat building. She was a spaniel mix, who was a good swimmer, and was at home in the punt tied off behind the stern of a lobster boat. So there she is, out in the water. And then photo seven, Here's Lucky supervising the launch of the Buddy, Buddy and Sylvia. So tell everyone what's what. But wait, thank you. Um, so on Beals Island, the whole town turned out for a launching, especially for the Buddy and Sylvia, which at 33 feet ranked as the largest boat built on Beals Island at the time in 1950 using round logs. So if we zoom in, you can see the guy in the stern placing the log roll at the stern. So they've, everyone's holding tight because they've taken the log that's been used already from the bow, running it to the aft, to the stern. Um, you can see there's a lot, log right there between those two guys' feet. So they literally rolled the boat down the slope from the builder shop to the beach. You can see everyone holding the boat upright and in place. There's Lucky Dog supervising again. And so the next photo, you can see everyone heaving for all their worth. And muscle power is doing what a truck 
her boat trailer would do today. And so they're almost down to the shore. And so they would somehow turn it around and launch bow first into the water. And luckily you'd had some young kids or gentlemen um, ready to help guide her into the water. And vinyl, if before you go too far, is the guy in the cap on the left side of your picture. So he's up at the bow, making sure it's launched the way it needs to be. And there's women at the launching. Everyone turned up to help. Photo 11. Um, so like most 1950s Beale Island boats, the Buddy and Sylvia did not have a shelter for the lobstermen, just a piece of canvas on hoops to keep the engine dry. And so the engine is right there, if you can see Gina's cursor. And then I think it's a table just after there for cutting bait or whatever they need to do or holding the chart. Um, there. And then if we can go to the next photo. <clears throat> so here it is with the, the canvas on top of those hoops. And Osmond recalls that vinyl was really good about ducking under the spray behind the hood, the spray hood. So, um, so it was probably tall enough just for him to peek over. Um, and then when you saw a wave coming, duck under that canvas. And just aft of the canvas is that vertical wooden tiller um, called a struggle stick by the Beals Islanders. So you can imagine a tiller being vertical and trying to struggle with that to turn the boat. And then I'm back on my screen. So when Billy Thompson um, of Addison bought the boat in 1961, he built a cabin, a shelter cabin, uh, in the Beals Island style, nice and low. And then as we saw before, it's got the cabin Below, there's some bunks, more of a bench if it really got rough or somehow you got cut out in the elements. You could bunk down here with the warm engine. And it's got the diamond windows, which was another Beals Island style to have nice and low. Um, you can just barely sit in here enough to just stay out of the elements. So can we go to photo 13? Oh, here you can see the low cabin with the diamond window and the Thompsons out fishing. And if we go to the next photo, so she was fished by David Thompson, who was the nephew of Billy Thompson, who had bought the boat from the Beals. And then finally by Billy's brother, uh, Ken, and they renamed the boat Genevieve. So here you see, I'm not sure which of the Thompsons this is, but he's got a, his good catch of lobsters there. So then we can go back to my screen. Um, so there was a question about what the sail in the back, back is. So the boat was propelled by the motor 
but it would have a steadying sail. And so um, if you're familiar with sailboats, uh, if you go into irons or you get the boat into the nose into the wind, then the boat sort of, sort of stays steady and doesn't go from side to side. And so the sail basically is steadying the boat as you come up to a lobster trap. You get the boat into irons and it holds the nose of the boat into the wind, maybe into the waves, um, just makes a more stable platform for the boat. So thanks for that question. Uh, so Beals Island was home to generation of Beals Island's boat builders and is located uh, down east. So here we are in Searsport, Mount Desert Island, uh, and Beals Island is right here. And then if you go further, you get up to Grand Manan and Eastport is up this way. So almost halfway between Mount Desert Island and Eastport. And here we have Beals Island, uh, a better uh, zoomed in, let's say. Um, so Beals Island is here, Jonesport is here. This is the Musabek Reach, uh, Great Wasp is there. And so Musabek Reach, as you can see, is between the mainland and these outer islands. And then here's the broad Atlantic Ocean. And so these islands provide a little bit of protection from the elements. Um, so maybe some lobster in here. But you needed a boat that could go offshore and deal with the elements out here. And so a distinctive type of lobster po boat, the Jones Porter, was narrow, light, and fast, was designed for these unique conditions. So can we go? <clears throat> um, Matt asked when it was last used. Uh, about 2000, so 1999, it was last used. So if you can zoom in down on Beals Island here. And you can see the boat builders in the area. Osmond Beale is there on Alley's Bay, um, the middle of the three. Um, if you live on Beals Island, it's probably likely that your last name is either Carver Alley or Beal. So you can see a lot of the alleys and the Beals represented in the boat shops there. So in 1912, <clears throat> Nova Scotian Will Frost arrived in Beals Island and designed a new type of lobster boat, the Jones Porter, and taught the Beals and the alleys the tricks of his trade. His fast, narrow boat reflected his Canadian heritage. Frost moved to southern New England and eventually to Portland in 1934. Can we go to the next photo, please? And zoom in to the lineage. Um, so on the far right is the the moose uh, the Jones Porter style lobster boat, and you can see that it's descended from the Peapod and what they call the Reach boat or the Musabek Reach boat. So Professor C. Richard Lunt interviewed lobster boat builders on Mount Desert Island and Beals Island in the 1970s and created this lineage of the main lobster boat. And like I said, he narrowed down the ancestors of the Jones Porter to the Peapod and the Musabek Reach Boat. So if we go zoom up to the center image. Uh, so we have a lot of Peapods in the collection, just not in the building where I am right now. So we're just going to look at this boat plan for the Peapod. 
The general pea pod was 16 feet long and could be railed and rode, sorry, rode and sailed with very little comparative effort. The symmetrical double-ended design allowed lobstermen to access the narrow craggy shoreline of Maine to catch lobster and reverse that without having to turn the boat 180 degrees. The symmetrical design was not conducive to engines, so the main lobster boat builders adapted the form into a pumpkin seed shape, a pointed bow and a broader stern to balance out the weight of the engine. Can we scoot to the right? So here's the Musabek boat, which was an open sailing boat with a double-ended design. It was skeg-built keel was evident in its descendants. The double wedge shape of the Musabek reach boat with a flat underbody towards the stern made the transition to power more easily than the peapod hull. And then can we scoot down to the bottom right, please? Okay. So in that photo, I said to look at the skeg built keel. Um, so skeg built keel. And here we have some great pictures by Sam Manning, who is an amazing um, technical illustrator who just really lays it out. And so the external keel is bolted onto the boat after the keel is, the hull is built. Um, the hull is narrow and light, making for a very fast boat. And you can see the stern sloping to the bow um, has a nice angle with the keel, the skeg keel built underneath. And then can we go back to my screen? So another feature of a Jones Porter are low rails. And so there's my knee right there. So not much to hold you in um, when you're hoisting up your trap from overboard. And I'm not sure if you can tell, but the, it's got a nice, rounded hull right there. So a nice curve. It's very distinctive to a Jones Porter. Um, by the 1960s and 70s, the Jones Porter design had firmed up and builders transitioned from wood to a replicable fiberglass mold. So now we'll tour the boat and please ask any questions. So this is the fuel tank right here. So can only hold that much fuel. Uh, this is the choke for the engine here at the wheel. We have the hydro slave for bringing okay, that's what that's. the line in from the lobster trap. First, you pull up the trap over this pulley that rolls and then around the hydro slave, which is mechanical advantage and helps you lift up those traps. And this is the hauler valve and then the throttle and go. Oh, I just hope that you could see the relation of the, the birch bark canoe gave way to the peat pod, gave way to the Jones Porter. And so really there's a lineage from the Wabanaki builders up to the present day and the Wabanaki are still building and so it's full circle.